We are building the company step by step. We're not rushing things and taking shortcuts. And I cannot guarantee investors that the uh, it's there. But I, what I can guarantee them is that if it's there, we're going to make our best effort to be this team, the one that finds it. What are you, what are you trying to say? Do you know that the two assets you've got, El, El Roble and La Plata, just aren't big enough? They're not interesting enough to the market? You know you've got to do some M&A to kind of get noticed? Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like it, remember to give us a thumbs up, It'd be much appreciated. And do leave your comments below. Help us understand the sorts of questions you think we should be asking, how you think we did, and of course, what you think of the company. And you can also get access to this as a podcast on cruxinvestor.com, along with an article and a transcript. And of course, for Crux Club members, you get early access to this video. And if you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, for more videos like this, click the notification bell. We spoke earlier today to Fernando Ganoza, who is the CEO of Atico Mining. They're TSX listed uh, gold, copper, VMS, Explorer. They've got assets in uh, Colombia, um, where they're actually in, in production. And they've also acquired uh, Toachi's uh, Toachi Mining's operation uh, La Plata in Ecuador, which they are developing. Um, so both copper gold uh, VMS uh, operations, um, we talk to them about what they think they've got today. We've talked about some 2019 figures, what their hopes are for 2020, whether or not they've got the scale of operation that they need to be taken seriously by the market. Market cap about 32 million bucks today, fairly erratic share performance. Um, but as uh, Fernando points out, this is a case of you're kind of hunting for a, a needle in a haystack in the sense that when you hit it, you hit it big. Uh, they're going to take their time, do it in a non-dilutory way, use the cash flow from the business to develop both assets. Anyway, lots to discuss. Take a look in the description below at some of those topics. Anything interests you in particular, click the number beside the topic. That's called a timestamp. And that uh, jumps you straight to the bit, that bit of the video. So enjoy what Fernando has to say. Fernando, how are you, sir? Doing very well, Matt. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, well, good. So, wh where in the world are you today? Well, right now I'm in Panama. I got stuck in Panama. Uh, so, I've been uh, all my two and a half months of quarantine here in Panama. Oh, boy. You literally got stuck there. Wowzers. And how are things yeah. there? Tell, tell us about it, because we, we've not spoken to anyone in Panama recently. So, is, is it all good? Well, it's uh, yeah, it is. It's pretty much the same as the rest of uh, Latin America, I guess. Uh, we're still in, in quarantine and will probably be uh, for, for some more time. The economy is starting to open gradually, but uh, most of us are still uh, stuck home, yes. And what, just, sorry, we, we, we are going to talk about your company, Atico, but um, in terms of your, because I like this, because we've got someone on the ground in the country. So um, obviously you've, you've explained Panama, but what are you seeing in Brazil? What are you seeing in Colombia uh, and obviously Ecuador, a place like this? Is, are people still a bit nervous or, is, or are we getting back into, uh, the, in, you know, back to work? Well, it's it, everywhere. It's uh, starting to open gradually. Uh, so certain sectors of the economy are starting to, to come back online um, in different stages. Uh, for instance, here in Panama, we, the government has set up five different stages. And the last stage will be where, you know, international traveling is, so, is open. And uh, we, I expect that will happen sometime in the third quarter. And that will most likely be the case from where uh, what I'm seeing for, for most of the uh, Latin American countries. It's interesting because we hear so many different stories about how different countries and, and states are coping because, you know, the lack of, you know, in, infrastructure or, you know, social behavioral norms. And uh, it's, it's just it's just interesting to hear from someone on the ground. But look, we're here to talk about your company, Atico Mining. So let's 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 do that. So why don't you kick off? Give us a one minute overview of the business and then we can pick it up from there. Sure. Atico has a clear mandate to become a mid-tier producer in the copper and gold space. We look for high grade, high margin assets in Latin America. We own and operate a uh, mine in Colombia. It's a copper and gold VMS that has been in operation for over 30 years. And we have a development project in Ecuador, also a high grade VMS. The interesting thing about these two assets is that 
they have a, a large land package that we control surrounding the project and the mine with, that are very prospective and where we think there's opportunity for a lot of exploration upside. So that's basically how we are, are the business model, of how we're trying to grow the company. Okay, okay. So I, I, know, I know anecdotally that you guys are good miners, but maybe let's talk about the, the family because you, you've got some history. Um, you, you started Fortuna Silver. So, you know, I think for people new to this story, it's, it's important that they understand your track record. So can you talk us through, um, you know, what you've been up to and perhaps what the team has been up to before you got at, started at ECO? Sure. The, the, the Ganoso family, led by my brother Jorge, started Fortuna Silver Mines in 2005. Uh, at, at some point during the development of Fortuna, we decided to create a new vehicle to take advantage of opportunities we were seeing back then. But uh, at, at that time, Fortuna was a pure silver place, so we were letting them go. And so we created a TICO. It was decided that my father and I will leave Fortuna to have uh, things separate. And we will, our day today will be in a TICO. It has been ever, ever since. My two brothers, they're still running Fortuna, and they are very much involved at the board level with a TICO. So it's a, it's a family story. And the strategy I just mentioned for Atico is basically very similar to the Fortuna strategy, right? So we, we look for assets that we can develop, build the mine but with exploration potential so we can increase scale, increase life of mine and generate value through that. That's basically how the San Jose mine turned from a project into now a 3,000 ton per day uh, operating mine. And that's what we're trying to do with a problem in Colombia and La Plata project in Ecuador, which we are currently developing. Okay, so, so you've explained the game plan. Normally I'd like to sort of understand what's, what's going on in the mindset, but I think you, you've kind of described what you're trying to achieve. Um, what's the, what's the long-term aim of the business? Whatever the, the, the plan that you have, what, what's the long-term aim here? Are you just explorer developers or are you, you know, like Fortuna Silver, looking at being producers and, and running it? Well, I'll answer the question saying that uh, Fortuna took a $40 million company to over a billion dollar company. And uh, we're trying to do the same. Okay. We're, we're basically em emulating that same business model. And uh, we, we are doing that through not only building uh, mines, but also increasing scale and size through exploration uh, organically in, in, the, in the claims that we own and not operate uh, and, and explore surrounding our projects. Okay, so I just want people to understand what they'd be getting into if they're looking at this as a potential investment. Okay, so understood. Um, let's start with Colombia because that's that's the producer. What if, Tell people you know what you've got there um, and what the plans are because you talk about having large land packages. Um, I'm intrigued to sort of see what you've got today and what you're going to be able to do with that asset because you're kind of, you know, what is it? It's, it's three 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 percent copper, two gram gold. It's kind of low lowish. What's the potential for this? Well, it's uh, it's actually I will call it a, uh, a high grade ore. It's uh, over two hundred dollars a ton, which is not easy to find. Um, but this, this is a, a high-grade copper and gold VMS that has been in operation over 30 years. Uh, we acquired it in late 2013, and since then we transformed it from an artisanal kind of mine into a, an operation at 900 tons per day with very high standards. It has a life of mine currently of uh, four years. Um, and it's, uh, it's still the limits of the deposit are undefined. So there is opportunity to continue finding more. The uh, geological information we have is that there's still potential to find more at the mine. Uh, we've had success at the mine, ex exploring the mine before. When we took over, this, uh, this mine was about to close. They had a six, mi six month life of mine. And since then, we have discovered 2.8 million tons uh, at the mine of high-grade ore. And again, the geological uh, 
information we have indicates that the deposit will continue most likely at depth. Now, beyond the mine, which we are currently mining and exploring at the same time, trying to replace what we are mining and extending the life of mine. And remember, this has been ongoing for 30 years. And when we took over in 2013, we have a six year life of mine. Now in 2020, we have a four year life of mine at 900 tons per day. So we, we are kind of, uh, we have our expectation is that we will continue replacing ore and it will continue going on. Now, beyond that, the, the mine is surrounded by over 6,000 hectares of a very prospective land package. We, we believe that's the, the big prize of this property, finding another VMS that will form a cluster along El Roble mine. For the initial years uh, since we took over El Roble, we only did surface exploration as we were focused on transforming the mine to give us the sufficient cash as we have today to explore without going back to the market. So we, with the operation, we did it right. It's a free cash flowing operation. Um, so now our plan is explore both at the mine and look for that other VMS that, that we, we believe is somewhere on there. We have 15 targets at El Roble, of which we have only drilled five. We still have 10 targets to drill, and we believe at least one of those could be a VMS that will then form the cluster alongside El Roble. Okay. And that's the game plan. But it, 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 feels, it feels quite slow. You've been at it a long time. I know you don't want to dilute your shareholders or yourselves, quite frankly, um, by going back into the market, but you know, you've, I mean, looking at your, the, the, the quarterlies here, you know, you got more cash in 2019. Great. Uh, I'm referring to the consolidated financials for 2019. You produced more cash. You've, um, you've decreased uh, the ore processed. Copperhead decreased. Goldhead increased. It's kind of, you've been working and it is, I say, you've up, up the standards of, of what you inherited or what you acquired there. But, there's no pace to it. Why, why, why move at this pace? Why aren't you going in and uh, raising more capital, get this thing going quickly, given the prospectivity of all of this land at El Roble? Well, it's, I don't think it's a matter of capital, Matt. I, I think that last year we drilled uh, over 15,000 meters. Uh, that's, that's quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I believe you can drill 30,000 meters in this property if you wanted to, very ineffectively, <laughs> wasting a lot of money from shareholders i think we are doing it at the right pace this is this is not a porphyry this we're looking for vms it's a different ballgame uh so we have to we have to drill we have to do some scout drilling we have to understand what's going on on below we have to refine the hypothesis and then come back really we're drilling two or three targets at the same time and we're trying to drill three or four targets per year and, and remember these targets are 300 meters by 200 meters and you and you you're, you're putting a couple of inch hole in that in that area and then you have to start you know fine tuning where you put the next and then and then you go on and on as you get more information you start refining the hypothesis so i i can double the budget for the exploration team and that not necessarily is going to bring any results it's just going to spend more money i think we're doing it at the right pace um, give me some indication um, about the performance numbers there, please. Sure, sure thing, Matt. So in, let's talk about 2019 performance. And I believe 2020 will look similar to 2019. We had a uh, cash cost of $1.24 per pound of copper net of byproduct and a London sustaining cash cost of $1.81 per pound of copper. That can give you an idea of the margin we can generate at El Roble mine when the prices are, you know, 240, 250. And if they get to three dollars, and that gives you a sense of the free cash that this operation can can generate. OK, do you think the market understands this? Because you're sitting at what have you like 32 million market cap today. You know, it's been a fairly erratic year in terms of share price, um, you know, obviously recently for obvious reasons. But, you know, do you, are you telling that story properly? You know, do people know what they're buying into? If you're moving at a certain pace because it's the right way to do it, you, you believe, and it's the right way to spend money responsibly, you believe, um, you're not getting any credit for that. Well, I, I think the current market 
situation or share price reflects the uh, size, the lack of scale, and the uh, life of short life of mine relative to other publicly traded companies. And I, I think I think that's the uh, conundrum with uh, El Roble, in general with Atico. Now, the flip side to that, Matt, is that you know a discovery has the opportunity to bring a significant re-rating of a company. And, and that's what we're that's what we're after. As we can increase scale and we can increase the life of mine, that can generate significant value from where we are today. Well, tell me, tell me about some of the thinking. Tell me about some of the discussions going on between you and your father, the rest of the board, which says this is the best way to map out and 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 develop this asset because you know thirty two million bucks is nothing. You've got a four year life of mine. The grades are, we'll argue, that around the terminology of high, high grade versus average grade. Um, but you know, ultimate ultimately, the the market's not hearing. A story which it understands, or you, you probably would be rewarded with, a, you know, a, a better market cap with a better share price. Um, so how do you go and decide how you're going to spend your money? You've got some income, you've got you know credit line, uh, so you've got cash in the bank today. So how do you focus your time, money, and effort? Because we haven't even discussed what's going on in Ecuador yet. So what what was what's the plan? Tell me the plan. Well, the the, the game plan has not changed. We, yeah. we will continue to increase uh, or re- replace the mine that, that we extract of the, the Roble mine. It's continue increasing the life of mine, continue to run a very profitable mine that will generate the cash we need to both explore at Colombia and then develop the, the project in Ecuador. And we will, in, in two or three years, we will end the uh, drilling, the, the 10 targets that we have left at the right pace say about 15,000 meters per year, which is, which is not a small number for a project of this type. Uh, and hopefully, you know, one of, one of those targets will end up being the VMS we're looking for. Okay, so that's, that's, a, game, that's a game plan. It's, it's fairly simple. Uh, you still have the exploration upside. It's, it's right there. And the downside is mitigated, but we are generating uh, the, the cash flow needed to continue moving the company forward. We're not going to market uh, to raise more equity. We don't need it. We can develop La Plata and explore a Roble with the funds that we're generating. Okay. So tell me about the acquisition of Tauchi um, in uh, Ecuador. Why did you do that? Was it literally country? Uh, risk mitigation, or did you actually see something there that you thought this this is fantastic? We're, we're looking for uh, high grade, high margin assets, and uh, we're looking them within Latin America. Uh, most of the jurisdictions will be willing to uh, to go into. Ecuador certainly one of those, and I think La Plata fits perfectly that description, alongside the fact that it has a substantial exploration potential, just as El Roble. So. We have, we have a, a nice uh, deposit that we can actually develop and put into operation. And uh, we see it very similar to a Roble. And then the exploration potential is there. So the, the story just replicates itself. So we just have double the possibilities of a discovery, if you will, with this transaction. And that's what appealed to us. The, the uh, possibility to have a second mine operating and then all the exploration upside as well. Again, mitigated by the fact that we are going to be generating the cash flow to sell on the exploration. Okay, but uh, what what did you know when you bought uh, Tauchi? I mean, uh, or, well, uh, uh, La Plata as it is now. Um, wh- what did you know? You're walking into this thing. You paid some money. It's going to take you a while to understand what you've got there, and it's going to take you know even longer to actually get your money back. So, do you think this is the high grade project that you were searching for, or is it a case of we need to do something to kind of keep the market interested? <laughs> no, no, we we have that uh, ample opportunity to do something to keep the market uh, entertained. Uh, but no, we stick to our guns. We have been very consistent in terms of what we're looking for, what we think can add value long term. Um, and we have been disciplined in terms of looking for that. And absolutely, I believe La Plata is that kind of project that will in the long term add significant value to shareholders. Now, we bought 1.8 million tons at 4.1 grams per ton and 3.3% copper, plus some zinc, over 4% zinc. So it's definitely high grade. It's an ore that's worth over $200 per ton as well, even at these prices. So 
uh, in our mind, uh, that's that's the, falls into the definition of high grade uh, and and high margin. Uh, now, in a couple of years, uh, and this has been a little bit delayed because of the uh, COVID-19 situation, but in a couple of years, we should have a fully permitted uh, project with a bankable feasibility study al alongside. So ready ready to to build. And we believe it's going to take only a couple of years to do that. So in a fairly short time, we can be in a position to start building this. We don't see this as very long term to start generating value from it. No, two, two years is, is, is no time. But you're, you're in many ways, you're a long way from that. Because if I look at your cash position now, how are you going to get from where you are today at La Plata to you know, where you've just said you're going to get to, you know, where's the money coming from? Well, the money's coming from El, from El Roble. Now, the, the, the cash position that you see right now is just a direct consequence of paying some obligations that came along the transaction. Uh, during, during this year, we should generate something similar to what we generated in 2019. 2019, we had over 17 million of operating income, uh, about uh, 24 million of EBITDA and uh, close to 12 million in free cash. Uh, so some of those funds are going into La Plata to develop it. La Plata will need for, for this year between four and five million in terms of its drilling and development, all included. And we should be drilling about 10,000 meters this year at La Plata. So we, we have the funds to actually move the exploration of El Roble forward and develop La Plata without going to the market. Okay, fantastic. So it sounds like again you're being sort of cautious with your owner courses, conservative with your with your capital. But you feel in in two years' time, La Plata. I mean, is it in many ways going to be usurp? Um, you know, um, El Roble. Is it is the emphasis going to change to Ecuador from Colombia, or do you? see yourself continuing to you know try and develop what you've got at El Roble? Well, I think we have doubled the opportunity to generate significant value because both assets have significant exploration upside. And as long as that upside is there, I think we have the obligation to continue exploring and drilling to, to try to turn that upside into a reality. Okay. But you talk, you talk about in your presentation about M&A. So you are... You don't buy good stuff cheap. You're not going to do that from cash flow, are you? No, oh, well, there, there's still opportunities. Of course, we are limited or constrained by cash and by our balance sheets, for sure. But we'll, we'll see opportunities. What we look for, uh, we, we look from uh, post-discovery. We don't go into greenfields up to an operating in mind. And uh, we see those in the public markets. We see those privately. And we see opportunities there. Now, they, they're not, do not come uh, around often, the good ones, for sure. But uh, every now and then, we, we, we get to see good ones, and, and some of the, those are actionable. Okay. So we keep our eyes open, and we keep the, the, uh, we keep the opportunities. Uh, we keep working on opportunities that continue to come around. But why do you even mention that? I mean, do you, what, are you, what are you trying to say? Are you, do, you, do you know that... The two assets you've got, El Roble and La Plata, just aren't big enough. They're not interesting enough to the market. You know you've got to do some M&A to kind of get noticed? No, I still, I still think the cheapest growth we can provide our shareholders are at La Plata and El Roble, it's organically. And that, that's where our focus is. That's, that's where the team is devoted to. But uh, if you see a good opportunity that, that fits what we're trying to do and adds to it, yeah, and there, there are ways to make it work. Right, we we just won't let it go because we're too busy with El Roble and La Plata. Okay, like I look, I'm, I'm sensing you're, you're here. You're here for the long term. You know, I think some of your uh, shareholders uh, watching this were wondering whether you just you know got together with another Colombian gold producer and worked together. I won't name names. There's some. There were some some, some suggestions, but you want to do this yourselves. No, no, not necessarily. I, I don't think so. It just has to be something that will make sense for everybody, right? Including our shareholders. And if it doesn't make sense for us, then why, why do it? We're not looking for some convenient way, way out. We're looking to, to uh, generate value in the long term. And 
five, ten years from now, still be around, a much larger company, much stronger, still grow. That's, that's what we're looking for. It has taken us a while, yes, and I understand some investors have lost patience along the way. I understand. But you know, we're building the company step by step. We're, we're not rushing things and taking shortcuts. And I, it, it will have been a lot easier if uh, three years ago we had found you know, the big, massive sulfur at El Roble, for sure. And I cannot guarantee investors that the, uh, it's there. But I, what I can guarantee them is that if it's there, we're going to make our best effort to be this team, the one that finds it, not the next company that comes around. I, I think I just think it's important for people. And I think you're doing a good job of, it, of explaining the type of company you are, the mentality, the speed at which you're going to go, and, and then the rationale for that. I, I, I do understand that. Um, that's going to attract a certain type of investor, um, and it's going to put off a certain type of investor. But as long as people know, I can ask sure. no more than you being straight. Um, so you, you guys, the, I know you talked about your father, your father and yourself are, are in here, but you, the management directors are sitting on about 16% uh, percent of this, about 53% retail. I assume that's sort of North American retail. How do you, how, what are you saying to them? Because I, I, I'm in chat rooms and forums and there's just not a lot of conversation about your company. So what are you doing about that? Well, we, we do have a lot of, uh, of retail uh, marketing uh, in, the, in, the, in the past. We've been, been catering to uh, institutional investors because, because of the story, right? We've been shifting now to uh, retail, uh, the retail investors and doing that through different conferences. Of course, now they're all virtual and, and uh, we've been doing a lot of marketing in Europe as well where we, you know, we cater to retail investors that appreciate the uh, production, the cash flow we're generating, and, and the plan to grow the company. So we have been focusing lately on that. But why, why the switch to, or why the move to retail away from institution? What was the problem you're solving? Well, it's, it's not really a problem. It's just trying to increase the base because we, we were tightly held between uh, management and insiders and long-term holders where liquidity was a problem. So what we're, try, what we're trying to do is add liquidity through interesting retail in the, in the story. And that has worked well so far. You have followed, we have increased liquidity significantly in the story. Essentially, tell me, is Europe uh, now, because back in the day, you know, even 10 years ago, Europe didn't really understand South American mining. Um, are you finding that you're getting a much better response? Yes, yes I am. I am. I, I, I feel the uh, retail investor uh, gets the idea very quickly, understands what we're trying to do, understands that this is uh, a long-term story, but along the, along the growth path, you can have very quickly a discovery that will be a game changer, right? And from where we are, you can have a significant re-rating that, that will create significant value if you're right there in the stock. So they understand that perfectly. Okay. And one question about um, you, well, and your father, I guess, is you guys have been very successful with Fortuna Silver. I always wonder how, when management have made money somewhere else, how they remunerate themselves within a, the new structure. You know, do you need to take big salaries or are you just all about shares? I mean, how, how do you package a deal for yourselves, given your track record? Well, well, for, first off, uh, in, in our case, is the, the the board has a discussion with the board, in particular the compensation committee, to define uh, our compensation. And in our case, our preference is always to be to lean towards uh, the, the long term compensation, which is the stock options. In our case, mainly, so at around half of our compensation is uh, stock options is directly linked to the, to the faith of shareholders as well. Okay, okay. One more thing. Tell me about what do you know about mining in Ecuador? Because we've spoken to a couple of other companies this week who are in Ecuador. It seems to be everyone's rushing to Ecuador. It's, uh, it's the copper, gold, porphyries that are chasing and VMS as well. Um, what, what are you finding? And it's only re relatively early days. What are you finding um, it's like doing business in Ecuador? Are they ready? Are they ready for mining? Are they welcoming? I think, I think the answer is yes. Uh, the, the, the government is very clear on the fact 
that they need to diversify the economy from an oil-based economy and mining is one one of those uh, diversifiers that they want to introduce. They're, they're, so they're very keen on, on uh, attracting mining investment. Now, um, I think there's still a long way from becoming a uh, mining jurisdiction, uh, as you can call either Chile or Peru or Mexico. Uh, and there will be challenges along the way, as we have seen in, in Colombia, for sure which is also navigating that path towards becoming a mining jurisdiction. Yeah, so looking at, um, I think it's page 12 in your presentation, there's a lot of the big names are in there. Um, it's a lot of companies, a lot of big names uh, mining there. So it's, it's obviously a, a region, a yeah. district, uh, which people um, have a lot of faith in. And there's, I think, billions of dollars of infrastructure being put in place and billions of dollars of drilling as well. So it, it's an intriguing story. It's a new story um i'm kind of looking forward to well i'm sure you'll call us up and tell us all about how you're getting on there but uh ecuador seems to be in the front of everyone's minds look fernando thank you thank you very much for introducing the story first time you do come back on again and uh when there's some updates along the way um you know i, I, I like like what you're doing um you know, and uh, good luck for this year. And I hope you do manage to leave uh, Panama at some point soon. I, I hope that too. Well, thank you very much for hosting me and uh, happy to come back when we have news to update your audience. Thank you very much, Matt.